everyone and welcome back to another video. My name is Sarah, I'm a junior doctor working near London and in this video I want to take you through a typical day in my life working in the emergency department. But this time I want to talk about the typical cases that I see in ED. Obviously I can't film these for you but I can tell you about them by anonymizing everything. I take you through how these patients typically present to the emergency department, how we go about assessing them and finally how we manage and treat these patients. I talk about some very key lessons and learning points that I took away from these cases as well. If you're a medical student this is a great way to learn about practical cases and even if you're not interested in medicine at all I think these are quite interesting cases that we can all learn from. So today I'm going to be talking about three cases and the focus or theme of today is going to be elderly patients. Um, I think that not enough time is spent on uh, these cases and these patients in medical school and they are a massive proportion of the population and therefore you will see a lot of them in ED. They are going to be your more complex patients because they have a lot of comorbidities, oftentimes they're on a lot of medication that obviously all have side effects so that makes it very complicated to treat them and it can sometimes be difficult to assess or take a history because depending on the patient they may have uh, dementia or difficulty communicating. Now I'm not saying that all elderly patients are like this, but these problems are more prevalent in this population. So it makes their cases very interesting, but also very difficult to manage. And there's a lot to learn from these cases because they don't fit into the neat boxes of diagnoses that you will see in medical student textbooks. A lot of the time they can present with a very common diagnosis like a heart attack, but present very differently to how a young, healthy person would present with very different symptoms or atypical symptoms, as we say, that make it a lot trickier to assess. So it's very important to be aware of this when you're assessing an elderly patient. Without any further ado, let's get started. A very common presentation in ED is abdo pain. So our first lady, Mrs. J, is a 72 year old patient who presented with abdominal discomfort. This had been going on for about two weeks and she also reported being constipated and not really being able to open her bowels properly. When you're asking about a bowel history, it's very important that you ask about how much as well. It's important to delve into the details, especially with elderly patients, because if they say they opened their bowels this morning, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're not constipated or that they don't have a bowel obstruction. Um, it could have been a tiny amount that doesn't even constitute as a proper passing of stools. So she had opened her bowels this morning, rabbit stool droppings as we say, and she had been passing wind as well. She had no nausea, no vomiting, and the pain in her tummy was quite generalized, more in the right and left lower quadrants, and it was more discomfort than pain as she put it. She'd tried some laxatives at home, which hadn't really helped. She'd had some surgery done on her tummy years ago, including appendectomy and ulcers removed, but other than that was quite fit and well. And on examining her tummy, it was soft, her bowel sounds were present, and it was just mildly tender on palpation. Her observations, so things like temperature, blood pressure, heart rate, they were all normal and her blood test came back completely normal so there were no inflammatory markers or anything concerning. At this point there wasn't anything particularly concerning and it was a very real possibility that she just had some constipation. Now in the emergency department there are certain cases that absolutely need to be reviewed by a consultant. So these include a child with a fever under one years old, an elderly patient, so over 60 years old, complaining of abdominal pain, or a patient who's over 30 coming in with chest pain. The reason for that is oftentimes some very serious diagnoses can be missed, and these patient groups can be quite tricky because they can be very unwell very quickly, and also they can present in many different ways. So you need somebody with all those years of experience to be able to pick up if something's a bit off. So I discussed this patient with my consultant, and we were discussing whether or not we should be scanning her tummy to rule out any bile obstruction, or diverticulitis which is an inflammation or infection of diverticula which are small outpouchings that can form in the lining of the intestines when you get older. Now her presentation didn't exactly fit with any of them but on re-examining with a consultant and in view of her risk factors with previous abdominal surgeries we felt that it was appropriate for her to have the CT scan and she ended up having acute diverticulitis. She was admitted under the general surgeons and treated with antibiotics and fluids. Now there are lots of things to learn from this. Obviously you can't go around scanning all elderly patients as soon as they're complaining of pain anywhere at all on their bodies. But one thing that my consultant reminded me of is being wary before jumping to diagnoses like constipation or other ambiguous differentials. 
Whenever you're assessing a patient, even if it's the most simple case you've seen, always think what is the most likely diagnosis and what is the most serious or life-threatening one that I would not want to miss. And by doing that, you create a structure in your mind where you go through these serious conditions and you explain to yourself logically why you don't think it's those things. And at least then you have a rationale for not suspecting those diagnoses rather than missing anything out. So if ever in doubt, just make sure that you discuss with a senior and get their input. The next lady we're going to talk about was a lovely 91-year-old Mrs. W. She came in via ambulance and the notes that we had on admission was that she had had a fall. She was not on any blood thinners and it was said that she'd just fallen from a seated position, so not a very big fall. She also had a background of dementia, which like I said earlier on, can make the history a bit more difficult. I saw this lady in Amber Majors. Now before I tell you about her, I need to explain a little bit how my ED department runs. So there are two main sections in ED, red and amber. Red are where all the COVID or query COVID patients go, and amber, which used to be green, is where people who typically do not have any respiratory symptoms, any COVID symptoms, go to. In red, you have red majors and recess. So recess is where the acutely ill patients who come in via ambulance and need acute critical care go to. In recess, we also send the trauma calls. So that's basically anybody who's had a big fall or has had a traumatic accident like a car accident or motorcycle accident and then move straight to recess where we do a primary and secondary survey so a top to toe approach to look for any fractures any bleeds etc and red majors is where most other patients come in sometimes we move patients from red majors to recess and vice versa in the amber section you have pediatrics which is obviously where all the kids go to ambulatory or minors, which is where you have more minor things like fractures or sprained ankles, that sort of thing, and amber majors, which is the same as red majors, except that they don't have any COVID symptoms. So back to the story. This lady was moved to amber majors from the ambulance line because she'd had a minor fall and she wasn't on any blood thinners. If you have an elderly patient who's on blood thinners and has had a fall, especially if they've hit their head or are confused, you would do a CT head straight away. So that wasn't the case for her. When I went to speak to her, she looked a bit tired and was pleasantly confused, uh, knew where she was but wasn't exactly sure what had happened. Of course, I didn't know this patient personally, so I didn't know if this was her baseline or this was new from her fall. And when I asked her more about the details of her fall, she told me that her wheelchair had moved back, she'd fallen on her bottom and then also hit her head against the stairs. So she had had a head injury. At this point, I stopped taking a history and assessed her head and neck. Now, obviously, if an elderly patient has had a fall and injured their neck or their head, we need to immobilize them until we do a scan to make sure that they don't have any fractures. If they do and they keep moving their heads, then obviously they can make that much worse. She did have some tenderness in her cervical spine and had some bruising on her head. At this point, we immediately immobilized her head, called over a team for support, moved her to a trauma mattress and wheeled her to recess for a primary and secondary survey before she would go for a scan and explained to her why we needed to do what we were doing. We used some wedges to immobilize her head. I did a primary survey with one of the senior doctors and that's where we do a quick once over top to toe to make sure that there are no obvious fractures no obvious bleeding. It's basically like skimming a book before you read it in more detail, which would be the secondary survey where you go from top to toe again, but in a much more detailed and meticulous fashion. Thankfully, this lady did not have a bleed in her brain and did not have any C-spine fractures. She did, however, have a pubic rami fracture, so on her pelvis, but that's something that's managed conservatively and doesn't need an operation. So she was admitted for a frailty review, and that's essentially to make sure that there aren't any obvious causes to her fall, like polypharmacy, so being on lots of medication, looking at her lying and standing blood pressure to make sure that there isn't a drop, getting physiotherapist and occupational therapist review to make sure that she's safe on her feet and has the support she needs at home. Essentially a holistic workup to try and reduce this lady's risk of falls. So the very important lesson to learn from this case is not to assume. Just because this lady was in amber majors and we'd been told that she'd had a minor fall with no head injury and was not on any blood thinners, it's important to be thorough in your history and examination and not to assume that what you heard before is necessarily the case. Especially in the context of a patient who's had dementia, who may not have told the exact story to the paramedics, it's difficult to get an exact history. The danger, especially in somewhere like ED, is if somebody makes a wrong initial diagnosis and the next person who sees the patient follows that wrong diagnosis, and we keep doing that again and again rather than thinking from first principles and making sure we keep an open mind and consider different differentials, we can go down the wrong rabbit hole and it can have catastrophic consequences for the patient. I think this is extremely translatable to everyday life. If you hear something from somebody or you see something on the news, don't just assume that that's correct. 
Do your own research, have some critical thinking, and don't just follow assumptions and conclusions blindly. It can be very dangerous. The other point to learn from this case is to have a high degree of suspicion for elderly patients who've had falls. Oftentimes, elderly patients who've had falls will respond much better to a higher level of pain and damage than a younger person will. So you won't be able to judge from their level of pain or what they're complaining of how serious their injury was. So make sure you do a proper survey and if you have any doubt of any possible fractures or any possible bleeds, make sure you get some senior input and do the scan that's necessary because a lot of fractures and bleeds are missed in elderly patients. The final case I want to talk about is a gentleman that I saw in recess. So this was a 75 year old Mr. O and he came in brought in by paramedics who had found him on his bed acutely confused in a pool of his own urine. Now we didn't know much more about him except the fact that he was diabetic and the first things that popped into my mind when he came in was what was causing his confusion. Was it driven by an infection? Was he septic? Did he have a fall and trauma to his head? Could he be having a hypo? There's all sorts of things that could cause confusion which makes it very tricky especially in elderly patients. The paramedics suggested that it was possibly a UTI that was causing this confusion. Now like I said in my previous point make sure that you don't put your blinkers on and narrow down to one specific diagnosis or assumption. As all medical students will know, when you see a patient, especially if you're not sure where to begin with and you're not exactly sure what's going on, always start with an A to E assessment. For those of you who don't know, the A to E approach is a systematic assessment of a critically ill patient. It goes through a chronological order of the most likely things that could be causing this patient to be acutely ill or the most serious aspects of their condition, with A being the most important thing, which is the airway. While I was doing my A to E assessment, the nurse in recess was taking some blood and a BBG so that we could get some immediate information that would help us with our diagnosis. In terms of the A to E, it's pretty unremarkable his airway was clear, breathing was fine, he was slightly tachycardic, had a low blood pressure um, and was a little bit febrile. He looked pleasantly confused, wasn't sure where he was. He had a GCS of 14, so the GCS is the Glasgow Coma Scale and it's used to reliably measure a person's level of consciousness after having a brain injury. It's based on visual, verbal and motor response and because of his confusion he scored 14. We also incorporated a quick primary survey in the A2E assessment because we didn't know if he'd had a traumatic event or not. And he did have a bit of tenderness on his right hip and left chest wall. At this point, we got the BBG back and saw that he was very hypoglycemic. So his glucose, I think, was about 1.4. So we immediately gave him some dextrose. His lactate was also high at 3.6 and he had a really poor renal function with a very high creatinine and urea. Now a patient with a background of chronic kidney disease could have a very high urea and creatinine and that could be normal for them. Um, obviously we didn't know much about this gentleman so we compared two previous results on the system and he did actually have a generally poor renal function but on that particular day it was even worse than it usually is. We also found out on the computer system from previous records that he was indeed on blood thinners. So at this point with the limited information we had gathered we started him on dextrose for his hypoglycemia, gave him some fluids as we were querying sepsis and a possible source of infection. We started him on dextrose for his hypoglycemia, gave him some fluids, some antibiotics to cover for a possible source of infection with sepsis and he was sent for a CT head, chest, abdomen, pelvis because he was on blood thinners and had some tenderness and confusion and we were querying whether or not he had any fractures or intracranial bleed. While he was gone for his CT scan, I called his next of kin, so the sister, to find out what were the events that preceded today's presentation. And I found out that he'd actually had multiple falls in the last week with fluctuating confusion over the last week as well. Um, he'd fallen, he's injured his head, and she was sure that he'd had lots of unwitnessed falls as well. So that changed the entire picture from initially thinking that it was possibly, you know, just a, a UTI or even sepsis, to there also being a very important element of trauma to this patient. She told us that he had very poor management of his diabetes and had had fluctuating hyper and hypoglycemic episodes, which also resulted in his confusion oftentimes. We also asked about his home situation and found that he lived alone, which didn't help because she only saw him once every two days and couldn't give us an exact history of what had been going on before then. The CT scan showed us that there was no bleed in his head, but he did have multiple 
multiple rib fractures and pubic rami fractures as well. Rib fractures are managed conservatively and you don't operate on them, so we gave him some more analgesia and put a lidocaine patch over the area that was most tender. We then had a very long discussion with the medical and surgical team as to where he would be best treated in the hospital. Typically, rib fractures go under the general surgeons, but because this gentleman had multiple problems, including his fluctuating um, glucose levels and ongoing confusion with possible sepsis, it was agreed that he would go under joint care of the medical and surgical team to make sure that all these aspects were addressed. I found this case really interesting because there's so much to learn and reflect about. And one of the main things for me is that there isn't just one thing that's going on. This patient who came in with a possible UTI ended up having hypoglycemia, sepsis, and multiple fractures. Patients don't present themselves like in medical books with all the symptoms pertaining to one single diagnosis. Even when you found a problem to fix like the hypoglycemia, don't just stop at that and think of anything else that could be the case. I know I keep repeating this, but it's so important to keep a wide scope of differentials and keep an open mind as to what could be going on and not to just stop once you've found one thing to fix. Again, this is something that's super transferable to real life and it might be a bit cheesy for some of you, but if somebody does something to you that you find annoying or offensive, don't just jump to the conclusion that they're doing it specifically to spite you or it was against you in a particular way. There are a hundred different reasons why they might have done what they did um, and I think it can give you a lot of peace and satisfaction reminding yourself that not everything that happens to you is because of you or in spite of you. The other really good reminder from this case is to always get a collateral. Sometimes we're so focused on the patient and trying to treat the patient and managing their symptoms, we forget that we may not have the complete picture. And the next of kin are oftentimes really helpful to give us a bit of a background of the days that preceded the event and what exactly brought us up to this presentation. On the same note, if something happens in your day-to-day -day life, try and understand what actually happened, try and get collaterals and speak to people before coming to a conclusion and deciding how you're going to act on it. These are three specific cases that I saw in ED, but a lot of presentations look like this in the emergency department. I hope you enjoyed this video and found it interesting. If you did, please give this video a thumbs up. Tell me what you would find more useful, whether that be more clinical or with less detail. And remember, you're going to be an old person one day and you want to be treated with care. So if you know any medics out there, share this video with them so they can benefit. I hope you have a great day and I will see you in the next video. Bye.